Hi. Hallo. Grüezi. I think we can all agree that 3D printing is a really cool technology. But I think most people underestimate the capabilities of 3D printing, especially when it comes to materials and methods. Because did you know that we are already capable of 3D printing with human cells? But there is another technology I really love, and that is robotics. Robotics also has plenty of applications, but what if you combine those two? So this is what today's video is about. You might think combining 3D printing and robotics was already done, right? I mean, fair enough, you can buy setups like those commercially now. But as you might have already recognized, we are again at the University of Basel in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. As some of you might remember, we already 3D printing implants on the point of care, but this project actually takes it a step further. We want to produce an implant inside of the human body. But we have to solve a lot of problems with that. And one solution is actually this really cool functionality. So let me quickly explain you why we need to 3D print inside of a human body and then we dive into the solutions we produce. So, but if you try to print inside of human body, you run into a lot of different problems to solve first. I want problems! That's why I brought to you Ruben. Ruben? Yeah. So this is Ruben, a friend and a work colleague of mine. Ruben, why don't you introduce your setup a little bit? As you have already mentioned, 3D printing is a really cool technology. We have started to see how they used it in really in the hospitals. We are seeing that they are using it for printing metal parts in aerospace, uh, taking it even to the International Space Station. And we have seen in all of these science fiction films these wonderful machines that the protagonist goes in there and they get in the machine and the machine does its magic and somehow everything is healed. That is really what we want to do with, with this setup. We want to be able to heal tissue by printing an implant, a regenerative implant, directly on the wound, directly on the patient. And this is what we have here. So you brought a little like mock-up setup for us. Yes, indeed. So this is um, a demonstration setup of the project. In this case, to showcase one of the challenges of uh, 3D printing in a patient. So for example, if we want to print a skull implant that we can see here, um, the skull is not flat, fortunately. It's very round and adapting to, our, to the shape of our brain. And because of that, we really want to print something that follows the natural contour and the natural shape of the skull. Maybe some people of you already know that uh, with non-planar slicing methods. I know there's a lot of like videos about it already where they try to print on some substrate. It's the same, right? It's fundamentally the same. So instead of here having an existing component, we have the anatomy of the patient. And to showcase that, we have this setup that we can just start and it starts to run and showcase how the robot can do this 3D, actual 3D trajectories. And I mean, I, I see that it's like marked with start and stop, so that's actually for people to interact himself with Exactly, it, so that they can just, as soon as they want, like start, stop and restart the process. And, and what, what's the pointless button? Well, it's just a pointless button, it does nothing. So of course, here comes the natural question of, but how do we want to do this? How do we want to print an implant directly on the, on the patient? What we think in our lab that it's the right approach to this is to first define the application and to first define in the case of an implant, what do we want to make the implant out of? Um, and we consider the case as we were showing with the little demo setup, this um, bone printing. And in this case, we consider, for example, a syringe like this with a small cone-shaped nozzle and we load in here different biomaterials, different uh, pastes that are biocompatible that you can place in the body and pretty much nothing happens and that even induce the regrowth of tissue, the generation of new bone and then we can create different print heads like in this case a mechanical extruder where we mount the syringe and this syringe will start dispensing the material that will be placed directly in the body and because of some special properties of the material it will harden and it will get fixated in place with the exact design that we can define during the surgery itself. Then the material solidifies, it hardens and it integrates with the native tissue. 
But what is pivotal to the project and what is actually the focus of, of my research is how we can precisely deposit the material that we have here using the print heads into the anatomy of the patient to precisely fabricate the implant. Uh, Ruben? Yes? What's NSFW? Wait, no, no, no! Most people don't have industrial 3D printers at home. That's why I'm excited to announce our partnership with one of the most competitively priced and high quality manufacturers out there. PCBWay. PCBWay is very renowned for their PCB manufacturing capabilities. They also offer industrial grade 3D printing and with worldwide shipping it will show up within days on your doorstep. So this is another really cool project we're working on for actually years. The project is called Miracle, which stands for Minimal Invasive Robotic Assisted Computer Guided Laser Osteotomy. It's a big word for a simple idea. So what this robot actually does, it has a little tip that we can put into the patient that laser cuts bone out of the patient. So we can get the tissue out we need to remove. So we basically put this little tip into the patient and there is a laser cutter inside that basically vaporizes the bone. And the only opening we have is a very small incision into the skin. And then we put the thing in and it can move around by itself and very accurately laser the bone away. But what use does it have if we then have to open up the patient to bring one of our 3D printed implants in here? So that's where the other projects come in. So I already showed you earlier this functionality of the robot, that it basically follows around this little marker. So the reason behind that is that a patient will not always be completely still. Even if you're under sedation, you have like micro movement, somebody could bump the table you're on and the whole printing setup should be able to follow that and compensate for that. But what I actually saw just right now today is like, we have kind of like, if I'm fast, we have like kind of a delay in here, right? So isn't that like uh, absolutely that sentence for that system? In a way, it depends on what do we want to use it for. So right now, this is, uh, as I was mentioning, we want to focus on cranial and, and reconstructing the skull. Mm -hmm. In these types of surgeries, the, the skull is completely fixated, it's completely immobilized. So those movements are actually not that fast or not that big in amplitude, so that it becomes a problem. Um, when we consider also cases uh, like the knee surgery, there, uh, if we think also in the way of a minimal invasive surgery, when we have the, the robot actually getting inside the knee, um, in these types of surgeries, the knee is repositioned during the surgery. And what we want the robot is to always know where the knee is. So we have the robot doing the printing process, then to reach a certain zone, the, re the surgeon will move the knee into a certain position, and then the robot can just retract, and when the knee is changed, it can go back in and continue printing exactly where it left off. Ah, so basically you don't need all that range of freedom that would actually like consider a quite big open wound again to accommodate the range of motion, but you can print half of the part from one side, and then just move out to the other side and finish this from there. Indeed. And that's the cool thing about these robots, that they give us the possibility and the flexibility to really confront the printing process from many different angles. To really say we perform everything in one go, we do it through different insertions in the body, to really adapt to different types of extrusion mechanisms, open surgery, minimal invasive surgery. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to use these kinds of robots. Okay. As you might have already, maybe some of you come out of the industry of like automation or stuff like that. This one is a robot, they, they are pretty well known around there. I will not tell you the, uh, I will not tell you the, uh, the brand of it, but that's actually just one of different robots you're trying to use, right? Exactly. So right now, for open surgery, because they are very well-established robots, they are very precise and very flexible, large range of motion as well, uh, we use these types of robot arms. In this case, this is, um, this is a seven degree of freedom collaborative robot that it would allow us to also have human robot interaction capabilities to really allow the surgeon to say, okay, start a printing process around here and then the robot could take over. Um, but we can also consider miniature versions. You showed before this miracle robot, this very small system. We can introduce these pensing mechanisms in there to have a more flexible and intracorporeal uh, 3D printing process. Miniaturizing this technology will give us a lot of capabilities in later going into regenerative uh, medicine and regenerative like medical robotics, actually, that then reconstruct stuff in your body or even replaces it in some points. 
And there I think you hit a very good uh, term, which is now we are working towards this, but if what we can do with these systems already, we can print with living cells that in collaboration with the cells in our body and the materials that we provide to reconstruct everything, we can make this whole process create new tissue. Like we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be printing an implant, we will be printing a conduit for creating tissue again, like, like really basically healing. A blueprint for the body to then take over and overgrow with its own cells. Exactly, and provide these additional cells as the construction workers for really performing all of this whole process. In the intro, I already showed you a little bit of bio 3D printing, where I told you we can 3D print with human cells. That's kind of like a simplification of the whole process. Yes, sometimes you have living cells that get printed directly, but you always have a medium carrying it. And this medium can be a hydrogel or different like ceramics that actually, for example, also integrate into your body. And this is actually what this robot should deliver at the end. So we are working really closely together between 3D printing, or medical 3D printing, medical robotics, and our tissue engineering and biofabrication, a part of our group and try to get all those technologies merged into, let's say, automated, personalized healthcare, in a sense. So the only problem I see with it is like 3D printing, as you all will probably know, is not a fail-safe or fail-proof technology. So I could just imagine how bad it would be to have like a spaghetti print fail, for example, inside of the body. How, how you want to like to prevent that? Of course, that's something that it's already hateful when it happens in, the, in our 3D printers. But in the patients, in this case, is a, is a mission critical aspect. Um, the problem with that is that right now 3D printing is really an automation process. We make our, we have our slicer, we generate our G-code, we dump it into the 3D printer and magic happens. We envision is to have a closed loop 3D printing, uh, to really have different sensors, different cameras and different mechanisms that continuously give us information on how the print is going. And then we can have our slicer with non-planar layers, with all the fancy technologies and machine learning that we want to integrate there. And then we can, while we print, monitor how the print is going so that we can make sure that the implant is being fabricated with the utmost precision, without failures, integrating these surgical navigation cameras, scanners, and different sensing technologies to make sure that what we are delivering, it's accurate and of high quality. So this is the seven degrees of freedom robotic arm. So seven degrees of freedom means your arm, for example, it has six degrees of freedom. You have like the up and down of your arm, that's one. You have this motion, that's two. You have this motion, three. You have this motion, four. You have this motion, five. And then you can turn your wrist as well, and that's six. So there is like one missing. What's the seventh degree of freedom? So the seventh degree of freedom, it's in the case of the robot arm, the possibility that I can go anywhere. So here with your finger, if you keep your finger completely straight, you can go into any point in yeah. any orientation, of course, within the limits of our arm. The th cool thing with this robot is that we can perform these motions. We can move our elbow and we can change the configuration of the robot while the tool our finger, it's still placed in the exact same position and orientation. But don't I have this possibility as well? Like now ah, I do it? And you're moving your finger now. Like this, yeah. Exactly, there is the second degree of freedom for you. Ah, so that's my seventh degree of freedom, this is my next joint, okay. There you go. And the cool thing of having this, this additional degree of freedom is that with robot arms, sometimes we encounter cases like this, in which the robot starts to align and we encounter that some motions really align with one another and that when we move from one side to the other, we have these large changes in rotation. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, this produces singularities or deadlocks in which an infinite amount of possibilities. So if you think of your arm completely straight and you want to move back, mm -hmm. you can think of moving your elbow down, but also out, but also to the other side. Mm -hmm. And this can cause a lot of problems from a computational perspective. What we can do with these robots is to, while we perform this motion from one place to another, to change our orientation of the elbow to avoid these regions of possible trouble. Okay, so a singularity is like a black hole, for example, is a singularity because it's like an infinite, infinite dense point. And here a singularity would say like from here you have an infinite way of doing it. In a way. Okay. For a very large motion you would really have to move really fast to 
perform a very small motion or you could do it in a million ways. So of course there's a lot of stuff that we couldn't show you yet because they're still under development and still like relatively new and we have to wait till we publish them. But we want to have this system basically as a multi-purpose machine where we can interchange those heads and have it perform different operations. For example, like we showed the, the, the big movements of a cranial implant that we can print a cranial implant on your skull or even like needle surgery or endoscopic surgery where something is done with like very, very small movements inside of the body. But I think how far we've come for now that we're on it for like about a year, of course, with work of predecessors is really cool. Like how intuitive it already works. I mean, I can really easily position the robot anywhere I want, even without training. And like just the fact that I can take this little marker and like move my mobile robot around in three dimensional space and it will reshape however I want is already mind blowing for me. So if you want to have more videos where we go into deeper like robotics and into high technology more than just like my basic tinkering videos, let me know in the comments down below. Also, we have a lot of awesome groups when it comes to virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, laser, bioprinting, all that stuff that we do here is super interesting and I love to do videos like that. Also, if you want to know more about the Miracle Project itself, I could do a video on that. Simply let me know what you would prefer if you want to see more of this technology, more informational videos, or if I should go back and print some silly stuff. Thank you and see you next time. Mic check. Oh, it's called the Miracle Project. That stands for Minimal Invasive Laser Osteotomy System. Uh, wait, where's the C? So this is Ruben. It's a, it, it. <laughs> Stay there, don't move. Then the hand can look like... Normally we have to do like a big... No, no, wait, wait. Don't, don't do the laser everything yet. Good. Come on. We're...